Hi, we continue in 1 Samuel 28 today as Saul succeeds in having a brief conversation with the dead Samuel that the woman of Endor has brought up. And it's certainly not a satisfying one for Saul, but we need to look at the details as we go. So a few things to orient ourselves. I won't go over these in great detail. If you'd like to know more detail, please see the introductory video to this entire section on 1 Samuel 27 to 31, or the earlier videos on this chapter where I go over some of these elements in a little more detail. So what we're seeing here is our continuation in the chiasm. It covers the second half of 1 Samuel. We're in the uh, green part here in chapter 28, parallel to the part up here in chapter 19 and 20. And one reason we're looking at it in this way is that we've been exploring the way that the writer or the final editor has created these two narrative sandwiches where chapter 28 is in the middle of these two pieces of bread, if you will, of David and Asich among the Philistines. And this sandwich is parallel to the one we saw earlier in chapters 24 to 26. So three elements of that that are important in our scene today. In chapter 25, Nabal, whose name means fool, really was the fool, the rich landowner, whom Abigail, her own, his own wife, called a fool. And that's parallel to Asish over here, the Philistine king, who looks much much like a fool to both readers and to the generals of his army. And here we have Saul, who is the fool that all these are pointing to as he desperately tries to get some guidance from Yahweh via Samuel, but gets none. So uh, we've been looking at it in this sequence because as I've been trying to show you that the scene and as David going through Philist and Philistine territory and then going down to Ziglag down here in the south, uh, around the, the Nahal River, which is a river, or the Wadi Basor down here, is happening parallel to Saul being up here. So the author is structured it that way, uh, I'm sorry, over to here, to suggest as clearly as possible that David was not there when Saul died in chapter 31. But that doesn't mean that David wasn't involved in it. When we get to chapter 31, we'll see some of the ambiguous evidence that remains despite David being nowhere on the scene. Uh, so another aspect we've been looking at, which we're going to follow in more detail today, is how this chapter, as well as the others, but I only made this chart in detail for this chapter, shows that the, the words and the language and the themes that we're seeing in chapter 28 bring forth the entire book of 1 Samuel and certainly the whole story of Saul. But before that, the whole story of Samuel back to his mother Hannah's uh, experience with the corrupt priest Eli, or at least the priest whose sons were corrupt, Eli, back in the very beginning. So I'm going to go over that in some detail. Before I put that up as our as our main text for today, against the, the biblical text, I want to highlight the key words in this section, which is really right, right here. And you can really see how hand is the key here. The hand of prophets out of your hand spoke by my hand and the hands of the Philistines. And as I've been doing in the key words charts, I've been trying to translate it more literally so we can see those parallels, which are often hidden by translations as the new RSV has here. So let's put the intertextual links back up and we'll listen to what the writer has us hear from the dead Samuel. And note that I'm not drawing much attention because the text doesn't to the metaphysics of the situation of what form is Samuel in here? Is he bodily or not? The text doesn't seem interested in that and doesn't address it. Does he look normal or not? Well, I don't know. We'll I'll show you three pieces of art, one from the 17th, one from the 18th, and one from the 19th century. But in all of them, Samuel looks ghostly. And that's really the best that the, that the painters can do, because how, what else do we know about what Samuel looks like? There is much art on this scene, and I could spend an entire session on analyzing the artistic images, but I'm not primarily an art critic or an art historian, so we'd leave that to somebody else to do. But I want to highlight across three centuries and three different cultural origins of the artists of uh, different ways of looking at this scene. Um, so, in the words, we don't have to worry about that. The text just has Samuel say to Saul, as you see on the left side, just like it's a normal conversation. So, we don't hear anything special about Samuel's voice or anything he specially looks like, um, other than that he was wearing his signature robe. And he doesn't touch anybody or nobody attempts to touch him. So, we don't know what his body down here raised from the dead might be like in relation to another body brought up from the dead, the body of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, but that's a different story. So, Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Um, and that word is only here in the Deuteromistic history, it echoes from Isaiah 14.9. That's the only example of that. Um, and that's one of the only things that isn't echoed elsewhere in 1 Samuel in this scene. So Saul answered, I am in great distress here. Um, and literally that great suffering or great uh, struggle, Sarli miad, as in 2.32, as we see here. So then in distress, you, Eli, as Yahweh is saying here, actually this is Samuel saying in Yahweh's name, with greedy eye and all the prosperity that shall be stowed upon Israel, and no one in your family shall ever live to old age. 
That's not quite true because one of the great grandsons becomes one of the priests for David, as we've already seen. But we don't know how old he is, so maybe he doesn't live to old age. We'll have to explore that more as we go. So Eli's distress as his um, priestly reign is being cut off is parallel to Saul's distress, as we'll see now and in the beginning of 2 Samuel as his descendants are cut off as well. Um, moving on into the verse, for the Philistines are warring against me. And note how much first person singular there is here. I am in great distress, warring against me. God has turned away from me and answers me no more. I have summoned you to tell me what I should do. It's much like the, the uh, little parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, where the man has a soliloquy speaking all about himself. But this is not a soliloquy. This is Saul talking to Samuel. But there's no mention of Israel. There's no mention of the army. There's no mention of being king. It's just simply Saul's uh, um, personal struggle in his um, aborted relationship with Yahweh. And so God has turned away from me, as in 1614. That's not one of the parallels here, but let's look at that there. The spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh tormented him. Again, highlighting that I could have filled in the right side of the chart on the right side of the screen here with many, many connections. There are many more. So turned away from me and answers me no more. Uh, and here we see the parallel to 1437 back here where Saul inquired of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Much like David just did about the Amalekites in chapter 30, will you give them in my hand, into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. Uh, so not answered either by prophets or literally by the hand of prophets, contrasting with the hand of Philistines, and raising the question of the earlier experience of the question of whether Saul was among the prophets or not, um, and the question of dreams omitting the Urim of 28.6, where uh, that's how David uh, got the understanding that Yahweh was on the side of him attacking the Amalekites. So having heard nothing, as we see here, um, so he says to Samuel, so I summoned you to tell me what I should do. Um, or literally, I called you 38 times in 1 Samuel, um, to tell me what I should do, or literally, to be taught what to make. Um, it's not just to tell, to teach. Saul is in the need of a teacher. He's really completely lost here. We saw at the beginning the description of being terrified, and we'll see later after Samuel is gone, uh, and after what Samuel prognosticates that will soon happen to Saul, namely his death, uh, Saul will be terrified, framing the entire chapter. So we get to the beginning of verse 16 here, uh, and Bodner quoting Eli, uh, Eli, excuse me, um, uh, Wiesel, Eli Wiesel again, how could a prophet of the God of Israel treat another human being so heartlessly, especially when that person is in such distress? And that's one of the questions that not only someone like Wiesel, but biblical scholars have asked about Samuel since the beginning. Um, since chapter 8, when Samuel was upset that the people had asked for a king, and Yahweh had to assure him, it isn't about you, Samuel, it's about me. But Samuel has been taking this personally all along, uh, and it's an interesting uh, element here that uh, Samuel is, is treated, treating Saul so harshly. So then why do you ask me, which is a terrible play on words here, a ter um, terrible pun as my note says below, paralleling the, pun, paralleling the pun on Rama just four verses earlier. If you didn't watch the last video, we can go back and see that briefly. Um, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out, why have you deceived me? And the word for deceiving here, Rama, is Rama. Um, so as Saul um, or is accused of Ramaing the woman, uh, Samuel asked, why do you Sha'al me? Since Yahweh has turned from you here, um, Yahweh seven times in uh, Samuel's speech there, which we can see here, Yahweh, 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 in that short sequence there, and that's the emphasis that no matter what, um, Saul cannot hear from Yahweh has turned from you and become your, is it enemy or is it neighbor? And that has to do with, um, as Diane Edelman says, a metathesis of this little um, piece of Hebrew uh, um, uh, from this. So if it's a juxtaposition of those two uh, characters there, it becomes neighbor. So it's either a mistake, a metathesis, a metathesis here, in that the scribe made a mistake, or it's a wordplay about enemy or neighbor, because just in the very next verse, we'll hear the echo of Yahweh. Here we see on the right side, Yahweh has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, which we heard earlier in chapter 15, given it to a neighbor of yours who was not named there. So is it that Yahweh is Saul's neighbor, uh, which is to say close by, or is it that he's enemy? Is an enemy, and it could go either way. 
So Samuel's not quite done yet, and we see his threefold statement here uh, echoing what we saw here in chapter 10, the threefold positive prediction of Saul's reign. Yahweh has done to you just as he spoke by me, by my hand. And notice the emphasizing Samuel's um, underscoring his own role in that. He could have just simply said that Yahweh said to you, but Yahweh said to you by me um, here. And um, we see that uh, paralleled here. For Yahweh has torn the kingdom out of your hand. Notice it was parallel to tearing the hem of Samuel's robe as Saul was trying to hold on to him after the Amalekite, uh, Amalekite incident. Torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. And whether we see and this is enemy or neighbor, there's certainly a wordplay here. Either they're opposites, that Yahweh is the enemy and David's the neighbor, or that Yahweh and David are neighbors together. Um, and that's an uh, interesting wordplay there. And now David is the first time that Samuel has named David to Saul. As we noted the contrast here, a neighbor of yours, one who is better than you. Um, so we'll just go down a few more verses to finish our passage for today before we look at the interesting and terrible meal scene between the woman and Saul. So uh, here, because you did not obey or listen to the voice of Yahweh, a central theme throughout the Deuteronomistic history, uh, starting with the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, where the command is, listen, Shema, uh, obey the Yahweh your God. Because you did not do that and did not carry out his fierce fierce wrath, using a figure of speech from the Hebrew here, harav afav, here, the anger of his nostrils. Uh, that's often an image for, for anger in the Hebrew Bible is um, large, enlarged, or snorting nostrils. So his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore Yahweh has done this thing, or literally this word to you today. And notice how that's echoing uh, what we heard back in chapter 15, where Saul said, I have carried out the command of Yahweh, and Samuel said laconically, or then what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of cattle that I see? Um, so Samuel's still going to go on there. And here's the, the killing um, blast at the end, and literally a prophecy of killing. Um, that will knock Saul over. Moreover, Yahweh will give Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. Yahweh will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Notice the little ABA chiasm here of giving you into the hands of the Philistines, giving the army into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow at the center, you and your son shall be with me. Not all of them, though. David will have to deal with some living sons of um, Saul in Second Samuel in the first chapters, as we'll see. But certainly Jonathan will be a part of that. Can we imagine being Saul at this point? He was already completely terrified. He's had to convince this woman to do something that he specifically banned while he was disguised. She identifies him, and he says, you will not experience any guilt for this and now she's done what he says she's brought up Samuel and Samuel's word is tomorrow you and your sons will be dead so no surprise here and there's a, a, a terrible ironic sadness here the word is immediately but literally it's hurry hurriedly Saul fell full length on the ground and it really is hurry as opposed to immediately we saw it a number of times specifically echoing back in in 9 uh, 12 up here um, which I didn't put on the parallels. Yes, there is. there he is just ahead of you, which is to say the seer, Samuel, hurry, he has come just now into the town. So in the very beginning of Saul's journey with the donkeys, he was told to hurry to find the seer, Samuel, and now the seer, Samuel, tells him he's going to die tomorrow, and Saul hurries to fall full length on the ground. And it's quite the description. Literally, as you can see below, Saul fell in the fullness of his height to the ground. And it recalls the very beginning in 9-2, which we can go back to here. We were told there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than Saul. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. So now Saul, taller than everybody, his entire length falls full length in the ground. And as Bodder notes, Saul's height marks how far he has fallen. And now we hear the echo filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had not eaten all day and night. Let's look just at a couple more details before we stop for today. So we've seen Saul's fear ever, ever since chapter 15 because of the words of Samuel. Notice not because of Yahweh as such. He already has no relationship with, Yah with Yahweh, and he doesn't take Samuel's words as the words of Yahweh. Even though Samuel said the earlier words of Yahweh were said via Samuel. So now these are just the words of Samuel. There is no strength in him, 
for to eat nothing all day and night. Was he fasting? Did he understand this is some kind of ritual or not? Or was he just too terrified to eat? We can't say. Uh, but uh, after this, we don't notice we don't hear that S Samuel left. We don't hear that, hear that Samuel either disappeared or went back down or anything else about him. But at this point, the woman will come to Saul and having done what, what he asked her to do, in other words, having listened to him, she demands that he listen to her and we'll see that next time. See you then. For, oh, oh! Before I go, I'm sorry. Before I go, let's look at these three these three paintings. I'm sorry, I almost forgot those. So here's the one from Matthias Stamm from the 17th century, and I'll put them all up together so you can see them uh, in comparative um, artistic images. Here from Benjamin West from 1777, and here from the Russian Nicholas Guy from 1857. Three images of the angry and disturbed Samuel uh, imposing Yahweh's will on the terrified Saul. And so what happens to Saul once he's lying on the ground, we'll see next time. See you then for that. Bye-bye.